thanks guys so much for uh, coming all the way out here to Atlanta, Georgia on a very slow plane, I imagine. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we got a fantastic, uh, fantastic crew here, a fantastic episode. Uh, really looking forward to, to getting through. So I um, guess uh, imagine everybody knows uh, myself and Skylar, but uh, I want to go around the horn here and uh, give everybody a chance to, to get to know uh, you both, Sven and Rich. Um, you know, a little bit about uh, who you are, um, kind of where you've come from, where you are today. Um, and yeah, it's fine. We'll start with you. Uh, sure. Yeah, you can you can probably discern my by my funky accent. Um, I wasn't born in the U.S. I was born in Germany. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I went to school in the U.S., did master's and Ph.D. in Stanford and mostly wrote large scale simulation software. And uh, then I did what every good German does, apparently, uh, joined a car company, uh, joined VW <laughs> and Audi, uh, got some things into cars, and then stopped doing all of that and started to build autonomous cars. And uh, I was lucky enough to be the lead engineer for a vehicle called Stanley, which uh, we entered into the DARPA Grand Challenge. We got lucky and won that one, and then Stanley ended up in the Smithsonian Museum, and I spec Junior, the following car. Then... Um, I got recruited to a venture fund um, called MDV. Back then, I had no idea how venture investing actually worked. I, I knew how to run engineering teams. And um, uh, started as an associate, became a principal, then a partner, skipping six years. And um, now I am at Coastla Ventures um, since really a decade, nine and a half years. I am one of the managing directors at Coastla Ventures. And I focus really on, on two types of things. Um, one is enterprise software in particular when it's close to the development process and the other stuff, and this is very pertinent here, is like really, really interesting technology lifts that give ideally humankind novel capabilities. So the most extreme one would be something like Hermes, for example, or something like Rocket Lab, where, where I'm an early investor. In. Um, started two companies in my life, sold last one to Salesforce, so I've been on the other side as well. Um, mostly a geek by uh <laughs> by by nature which uh which autonomy problem do you think is harder the uh car or rockets and airplanes oh cars are way harder on, oh yeah on the autonomy. <laughs> oh yeah there, there's just <laughs> way more things to hit on the yeah. ground <laughs> and the stakes are pretty high when there's when there's people all around it yeah yeah the, the, it's a much 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 harder problem yeah <laughs> Yeah, great. A lot fewer variables when you're going to space. There's, <laughs> there's not much to crash into. Yeah, there's a lot, yeah, many yeah. fewer parameters in the Monte Carlo. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Awesome. Uh, cool. Rich? Um, yeah, well, I'll introduce myself as well. And you can tell from my funky accent that I grew up in rural Nebraska uh, <laughs> and uh, also attended Stanford as electrical engineering, computer science guy there. And then, you know, my background professionally, I essentially spent my 25 years of a career in an operating role, um, operating executive venture back startup. So I was head of engineering for many years at a company called Risk Management Solutions, was a spin out of a research project at Stanford. We built computer simulation models to estimate the impact of natural disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes and floods and all this kind of thing and translated into real world impacts. And mm. then I uh, was at that company for about 10 years. After transitioning out of there, I joined another startup in the online real estate space, a company called LoopNet, where I was for 13 years um, as CEO. Took that company public, and then it was eventually acquired by a bigger public company in 2012. So long career as an operator from you know, being part of a team of four sitting in a room, uh, all looking at the, the fellow founders and building it from scratch uh, with first product out the door, all the way through the, the IPO and, and eventual exits. And then after that 25-year uh, run as an entrepreneur, I decided to experiment a little bit on the venture side of the world, did some angel investing, and then I actually spent a couple of years working at Kosla with Sven, which is part of the original connection um, both to Sven and, and to you guys, uh, and then decided I liked venture, liked the role at this point in my career. So I joined a firm called Keenan Partners, where I'm one of the general partners of the West Coast Tech team. What I do now is focus, uh, it, it's really aligned with my operating background. So I do a lot of things in real estate tech, and then I do some amount of things in what I would call frontier tech, AI machine learning oriented, and, and those types of big, deep tech bets. Mm -hmm. When you, both of you are, are working with these, you know, deep tech and engineering focused companies, does that scratch enough of your engineering background itch? Or do you have other side projects that you work on at home, uh, in, the, in the shop, uh, on the engineering side? Well, so um, personally, I have an unhealthy obsession with machine tools. 
And so uh, <laughs> we have. You literally should have seen how fast he ran across the factory to go look at all the machines. <laughs> yeah, you have some interesting machine tools here. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, and uh, as a family, we, we go MIG welding, TIG welding. We make some carbon ca fiber composites at home. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there's there, there are some, let's say, private sort of stuff that uh, the, 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 that we do as a family. Um, as far as the companies are concerned, I learned a long time ago that if you're an investor, you're not running the company. So you can give advice um, so that does not really scratch the itch yeah. for building things right. uh, my, myself because I don't really get to build it. Mm -hmm. um, so hence the compensation at home for some of these things. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. I mean, being a board member is... It's very satisfying in the sense of the span of you get to see a lot of different things, interact with a bunch of different companies and teams. But as compared to being part of the operating team, actually building something, it's a very different and very diluted right. experience. It's mm -hmm. just, it's not the same. So you do have to find so those types of outlets. In my case, uh, you know, I'm not a material science guy. I'm more of a programmer. So I like to mess around with little Arduino controllers and sensor packages. And I've got a small six degree robot arm at home that I can play around and make new things and mm -hmm. just have fun. What, what does it do? Um, right now, T today, <laughs> so I, I'm trying to work on one right now that has, and I get that you could buy this off the shelf, but it's more fun to try to build it. I've got a robot arm that will try to respond and listen when somebody walks in the door and point a camera at them. And then an image classifier that tries to see who it is. Hmm. And the reason I've got a house full of 21 year olds who are always strolling in at about two in the morning. And I like to know kind of who's coming and going. So, wow. <laughs> can I, can I buy that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's my own personal police state, you know, for my house. So. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's it doesn't work very well, so they're not threatened <laughs> by it. <but. laughs> awesome. Um, what? Why are you guys here? What? What was it when you first met the four of us founders at, at Hermius that really got you hooked? Or maybe the story that, despite all of our problems, that <laughs> the story <laughs> overcame our <laughs> personal uh, inadequacies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe maybe I can start on on this one. So, um, I had looked at uh, uh, f supersonic transportation companies. Um, it was uh, it's probably a matter of kind of a prepared mind because I already had looked at a few and was interested in in doing something in this space. But I had this this really large problem, which was there was no intermediate step. And there was basically well, we're going to build a supersonic plane but we're going to run a, a novel engine program. We're going to certify a completely new airframe, and then we're going to fly passengers in it. And and I found it extremely hard to get comfortable with this being like the step for the startup to take because it's, it's a very, very costly proposition. And as much as I loved the technology, I, I just didn't think I was smart enough to figure out like a way to finance that to, to completion. And so in work, you guys, and you had a really interesting intermediate plan. And also, I, I personally think a better value proposition because just going a little bit faster than, than what is out there is moderately interesting. But going a lot faster just increases the, the, the value proposition because these planes by, by very nature are going to be long and slender because they, ha they, they have to be. So I'd rather be you know, in a long and slender plane for a short period of time than for, for a long period of time. Oh, yeah. So the value proposition was better, and there was a sane stepping stone. And and that attracted me quite a bit. And then as a warm-blooded engineer, it's very hard not to get excited by Mark V planes. But I, I would say the same for Rocket Lab. Like a warm-blooded engineer, is not, it's hard to not get excited by, 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 mm -hmm. by rockets. But um, Big stuff that makes fire is... It's hard to look away from. Yeah, exactly. But but for me, it was really this. I was already looking for something like that, so so maybe I was already positively inclined, and I couldn't really find a thing that I thought uh, I could long term see a sane path for financing. And and um, and then you guys walked in. How how important was it that kind of Rocket Lab had come in the door? I don't know, five, seven, maybe years earlier, and you know uh, the success that had happened on the SpaceX side and the commercial space world. How impactful was that to be able to make a bet like this? Mm -hmm. Or I guess even further, like how close is the analogy? Like, I mean, 
I see it as certainly there are similar things. So um, I think that's for your sure. ability to diligence probably or something, you know. There's for sure a bunch of lessons that uh, that I think both companies can learn from each other. Mm-hmm. Um, both on how do you finance something like that? Um, how do you run the engineering for something like that? How do you uh, transition into a manufacturing org at some point? So there's probably a whole bunch of, uh, of lessons. And certainly Rocket Lab being successful um, made it a little bit more okay to invest in in companies that are really that that have that have a meaningful amount of technical risk, although I would say, in our fund we we also have uh, a nuclear fusion company, for example, or we have things like Impossible Food, um, where uh, it is really um, uh, meat that doesn't come from from cows, which needed quite a bit of development process to mm-hmm. to, to get there. So in our fund, it is. Um, I'm not saying you guys aren't special, but it is uh, <laughs> it is more okay to, uh, to 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 look at things like that because a lot of us are driven also by by seeing the next card of what humanity can do, and so supersonic travel kind of fits into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know the couple of things that I would add in terms of I became a believer early on in your guys' mentality that. Largely, this was going to be an engineering problem as opposed to a scientific research problem. And, you know, that was something that mitigated a lot in my mind of the concerns. Like everything Sven talked about is, I think, spot on in terms of how we were thinking about the business. But this concept that whether it's new technologies that have come online in in the form of computer sim and design stuff or additive manufacturing stuff or whatever, kind of open the envelope of things you can do. And same thing at our firm, we'd had some experience with aerospace type, you know, skybox is an example we were investing in. So companies that had pushed the envelope and done different things in the aerospace world than had been done previously. And that starts to smooth the road a bit to looking at future investments like this. But then, you know, to your point, Skylar, see, it's pretty easy to get excited about what you guys are going to do in terms mm-hmm. of the mission and, and the envelope what you're trying to create. Mm-hmm. I think it's, you both kind of touch on this a little bit, and it's something we spend a lot of time thinking about. It's like, when you're doing things like this, uh, especially in aerospace, it's not just like you have to have the you know engineering, you have to have the financing, but it's also like the culture plays a huge aspect in it. It's there's not, you know, you can do you can have both you know the engineering kind of physics based, uh, you know, it, it can meet physics, it can it can be real, uh, it can be possible, uh, and you can have all the financing. And if you do the culture piece wrong too, you can fully break the whole thing. Um, just because it's so complex and the interactions that are necessary completely drive the success. Um, and so it's, you both kind of like poked on it a little bit and it's like something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. I think it's about. generally true. I think it's not mm. only, so this is also true in my enterprise company. So, mm-hmm. so um, I'm an early investor in a company called GitLab, for example, that is completely remote. And, and they had to figure out how to run, and I think it's 1,500, 1,600 people now, fully remote mm. and that required uh, building a culture that basically supported that. I think it's generally true this for This was for almost pre-covid, right? This was pre-covid. Yeah, this was fully remote before it was cool. Yeah. But um <laughs> uh so so this this culture building thing is is genuinely uh, an important thing I think in almost independent if it's a deep tech company or not a deep tech company. Um it's it's just an important aspect. I think there are certain nuances that are true for deep tech companies. So for example, it would it, it would be impossible to run your operations fully remote. Um, you're actually cutting parts and um, making physical objects. So 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 that needs to be the case. And there is also um, there, there are certain cultural elements that pertain to deep tech companies that maybe pertain less to to pure software companies. Um, that's for, for for sure true. But like culture being important for all of them in general, I, I, I think it would underwrite. How, yeah. how do you think about that at the earliest stages when you first meet a founding team? When yeah, How do like, you measure that? Or yeah. estimate yeah, it? Or yeah. it but, <laughs> that, you, you, so I would say the, the culture is, becomes to a large degree the types of people that the founding team hires. And you can pr- tell quite a bit from the first, let's say, 20 folks in a, in, in a company and how the company decides within this really tiny group how stuff gets done. 
um, what gets rewarded, what gets not rewarded. Um, so, for example, do you incentivize that people help each other out? Or is it a cutthroat sort of environment where, you know, it's either you or, 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 or me? Um, what happens when somebody screws something up? What happens at, at failure? Do I admonish failure? Do I say like, well, look, this was a risky experiment that actually didn't work. And, you know, good, now we know. At least you were fast about it. Um, so you can typically tell quite a bit in the, in the, in the small, small setting of, let's say, 20, maybe 25 people total. And, and then it just magnifies. And then above 100 people or 150 people, then it, it becomes harder to... You, you better have like a, um, a defined culture already because it's going to become a lot more dilutive because the founders can't be everywhere anymore and all of that. So then it gets a little bit, uh, a little bit harder. But you can tell the, the main gist... I think within like the first 20 people or so. Yeah. And I, I think it's super important and, and you guys are far down the positive end of the spectrum on this. I think it's super important to find teams that are intentional about the culture they want to build as opposed to the ones that just sort of chaotically let it happen. The, those that say we have a defined culture that we're aiming for that we know we want to achieve and we're going to set the bar high in a few different dimensions and track that is super important. And I think with you guys, you're one of those firms too, where it, there's a little bit of a spectrum depending on type of business. So we're, we're a broad firm. We, invest in like consumer stuff and frontier tech like you guys, it's a very different culture. You know, you're not driven by, for example, the go-to-market side of the company that's trying to building up a sales-oriented culture. You're very, very focused. I mean, this is an engineering-centric culture, which most startups do at the early stage because by definition, you're building stuff before you can sell it. But you guys are going to have a much longer gestation period by nature of what you're building and how complex it is. And really setting the bar high for technical talent is, I think, an, an essence of what you guys have done in building a great culture and people that are not just brilliant technically, but understand sort of how to work together as a team, which is right. underestimated sometimes. And then the other thing that, that Sven referenced that I think is super important in, in early stage organizations like this is the learning rate. Like how quickly are you discovering new things, overcoming problems, which are always going to be there and recovering from you know challenges, which are always going to be there also. And then incorporating that learning and moving on to the next phase. And mm -hmm. that type of culture is what you really want to look for. And by the way, it's worth noting that, that I think at the time we invested and in, we led the series a, um, I hadn't met you guys in person. Oh, it yeah. it oh, was yeah. COVID had kicked in. And yeah. so we were, we had only connected live over zoom at the time that we made our investment initially. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. There used to be a part of our pitch where we'd say something to the effect of like, you wouldn't make an investment in a company over zoom, would you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We had to scratch <laughs> that chart real quick. Stop, yeah. just stop saying that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, uh, let's, let's move on to maybe a little, uh, uh difficult topic risk. Um, it, it's something that I think is really important for entrepreneurs to be comfortable with, but also understand how to, to think about and manage and, and work through. So and burn it down. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, broadly, uh, I'm, I'm curious how, how you guys think about risk. Obviously you've, you've kind of you know, sat in multiple seats, whether it's the entrepreneur or, you know, the, the, the investor, um, obviously there's, there's different perspectives. Um, but yeah, how, how you think about it, how you evaluate it, how you, you know, you, you want the founders that you work with to be deliberate about it. Happy to go first. I mean, I, I think it's, like most things in startup land, there's no simple, easy answer to that. Um, I, I would say the dimensionality that we tend to think about is, so there's different types of risk. There's technical risk, there's business risk, there's go-to-market, there's sort of existential regulatory risk that you can't control and all these kinds of things. And so you really try to understand what are the risks that are in your control, what are not, what are the ones that you need to de-risk and prove before you move on to the next stage. And, and that's one of the other things that I think is super important in startup land is Often people don't understand you're not aiming for the end goal out of the gate. You're sort of successively trying to prove things to graduate to the next stage, if you will, raise the next round of funding, get to the next phase of the company. And so you have to sort of decompose it into time, decompose it into different types of risk, and then try to understand, okay, what are we going to try to mitigate before we move to the next phase of the company? And, and that just wrapping your head around that in a big way for a really complex company can be challenging. But mm -hmm. That's how we usually try to think about it is break it up into those different types of risks, which need to be solved now, which under your control, what's your plan to go after, you know, piece A versus piece B. And, you know, how does that evolve as the company gets more mature over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would second all of this. The, it's important to have 
most of the risks under the company control as opposed to some external dependent variable that you don't get to control. And um, the other part is, is basically an element of, um, for, for deep tech companies, an, an element of engineering honesty. Where you basically go like, okay, so we are trying to build X. Here are really the things that we know or industry already knows how to make. And here are the things that are really genuinely novel. Here's the smallest amount of money I can spend to basically burn down that risk. This is the time and stage where I can actually afford to do this, or I will have the sophistication to actually do this for the, for, for the first time. And here's my plan B if this doesn't work, and here's my plan C if this doesn't work. So it's, uh, um, it's a little bit more multifaceted. Ultimately, I... In almost all of my companies that are deep tech companies, it comes down to having a genuinely honest discussion with the founding team about what these risks really are. Like, I, know, I mean, devoid of, of, of marketing and, 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 and so on. It's, um, it's, it's just having a really, really honest discussion. There, there's this perception that investors don't really like risk. I'm actually quite risk-seeking, but I would love to understand what the risk is we are signing up to collectively. Mm -hmm. And so this meeting of the minds of, well, this is the risky thing. What you're building is not technically trivial to do at all. Mm -hmm. So having this, this honest discussion about, well, here are the really hard parts. So for example, you know, in, your, in your case, the transition region and how do we think about this? And um, that also, by the way, is maybe a, a good addition to an earlier uh, question that, that you asked, what attracted me to, to this particular founding team was like, we could actually have this discussion in an open and honest way. And uh, to me, that's a really, really genuinely important thing because I'm, I, I tend to be with my companies for a very long time. And so I want this very open discussion about where, where the company is, where the risk really is, um, and, and less of a marketing thing. Mm -hmm. Which is a super important differentiator because I, I think sort of by definition, almost everybody involved in early stage companies, whether you're an entrepreneur or an early stage investor, you have to have a reasonably high risk tolerance and risk appetite, like everybody does. Mm -hmm. But the game is really about how do people understand how to manage those, mitigate those, execute against those in a, in a to Sven's point, intellectually honest way. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a team that is capable of doing that, it just makes such a massive difference. And keeping that transparency up so we can utilize you to help us solve those problems as well. It's like if we're having the full conversation about all the risks, then everyone is on the same page about burning them down instead of, uh, you know, and then or we spend time thinking about where are the unknown unknowns, right? Where are the corners that we're not paying attention to? Where are our blind spots? If we're talking about all the things that are in our field of view. I think there's there are two dangerous here. So this is like post an investment. So. Um, talking to your to, to, to your board and and actively hiding the risks is clearly bad. Uh, <laughs> it will probably not end and end, end up well. But I think the the bigger problem is that occasionally it is easy to to fool yourself into into thinking like yeah this is just not that big of a deal. Um, and occasionally then it's useful to pressure test that with somebody externally going like really what happens if this actually doesn't work. And what do we do then? And you know, you would probably then have like a plan B and a plan C, but it's actually quite constructive to, to, to do that because if you are in the thick of it, so to say, it's occasionally useful to, to step back a little bit and what's the big picture we're building here and what are the really big risk items here? Um, a lot of day-to-day -day stuff can, can, can just be solved, but there are these really big, big risks and occasionally stepping back, uh, having an honest discussion about them, that's genuinely important. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I've I've generally found when you know, I've done a lot of mentoring with with younger uh, younger engineers and uh, and whatnot, and people tend to overemphasize the downside implications of a. Like, this is in the personal sense, the of a personal risk, and underemphasize the upside potential if successful. Um, and like that's, that's kind of like a fundamental engineering thing, though. Yeah, like, uh, yeah. Mo mo most engineers um, will tell you what's wrong. <laughs> and, and they only when prompted tell you what are the implications if this actually works yeah and that's like i think a key element of, of entrepreneurship and whether it's the entrepreneur side or, or the venture investing side like imagine if the upside in, in what we're doing wasn't sufficient 
we wouldn't be here today. You guys wouldn't be here today. Um, like that impact is, is just so critical to, uh, you know, at the end of the day, making things like this happen. Um, but, uh, and yeah. we were briefly talking about last night, but, um, you know, we have, as Hermes has, have never had a problem getting an initial meeting. Um, even if people are very skeptical because it's, that impact is so big and it's also probably a little bit like, oh, let's see if these jokers, like, <laughs> let's, let's see what they have to say. You know, um, there's, even if there's a healthy skepticism there. It is really um, funny when like there's an engineer on the other end of the table who who is now sitting in the investor seat and they're like oh why don't we dig in and what kind of bs are we, we gonna hear now <laughs> and then, and then yep. it turns out like we like sort of know what we're talking about <laughs> it turns out turns out well that helps yeah yeah um so you know we've we've been through a couple stages of of growth here at, at hermius and obviously a, a lot has changed and the company is significantly larger than than it was i mean you know sven when when you guys invested it was just the four of us founders and and rich i think it was probably eight people total, including the four of us. Yeah. So, um, you know, we're, we're now about like 80, 81, I think something yeah. around there. Mm -hmm. So an order of magnitude larger, um, there's an immense amount of kind of personal growth that has to happen, uh, you know, for founders as companies change, mm -hmm. uh, founders kind of have to stay ahead of, uh, what the company is doing. Um, and, and same kind of goes for, for employees as well. Um, how, how do you guys think about what it, what it takes, uh, for founders, um, you know, to, to grow and transition into really strong executives, uh, at the end of the day and, and managers and, and growers of teams, um, as you know, you're kind of building your personal machine as you're building the machine of the company. So we have this concept of a learning rate basically where, um, as the company grows, uh, we also look at these particular founders, if, for example, they're first-time founders, how quickly do they learn? And that tends to be first order of magnitude, the biggest predictor on how successful they're going to be as an executive at the, at the company. What is the actual learning rate? It is actually not that big of a problem if there are new areas that this particular founder just doesn't know because he or she might have never done it before. That's not that big of a deal. But if the learning rate is really slow then this is becoming a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, one mitigating factor that one, one can do is, and we do a lot of this, is help our portfolio companies hire and figure out how to build a management team around maybe the, the, the set of founders that already exist. Um, that way, the founders don't really need to get good at everything. But if you have never hired, for example, a sales and marketing person, how would you know how a good one looks like, or a CFO, for example. Um, so occasionally we can just help in in guiding uh, gui guiding the hiring a little bit and also helping to get in front of uh, good candidates. So between deliberately building out the management team to cover holds that might exist um, and you know keeping an eye on the learning rate of the founding team, mm -hmm. uh, how quickly they learn new things that they might not know about right now, Maybe in addition to giving some mentorship, um, those are the things that that, that tend to work. I, and I would agree with all that. And I, I maybe add even like our earlier comment about intellectual honesty when you're faced with technical problems. I would say the same applies on organizational stuff. Like when you have a team that is aware of what they're really good at and aware of maybe where their skills gaps or knowledge gaps or experience gaps are and kind of want to understand how to construct a team that fills some of those gaps and is open about it, I think can be super predictive of people that are going to put together um, a well-functioning team that will scale and therefore the founders are sort of there for the long term and the other thing that this is a little more tactical in nature but i feel like there's and i've, I've been there when it's four people in a room and like your ability to solve problems because you know each other so well and you know you can just lean across the desk and ask a question and get an answer right away like that sometimes feels, you don't even have to open your mouth sometimes it, you just look absolutely, and you know absolutely <laughs> absolutely but that doesn't scale very well. Yeah. And so you, you people that are open to understanding that's the right thing to do at the very early stage of the company. But as the company begins to grow, you do need a layer of process. You need a layer of communication. You need some norms in the organization where you don't want the founding team involved in every decision. And some people can't make that leap very effectively. And sort of understanding to make this company really successful long term, we're going to have to build an organization that scales and that can operate in its own way is is a really important learning for some people i think and there, there's also this this idea that um 
often first time founders think that the company that they're building is according to the plan that they have made and believe in and shared and and that's mostly not true the company that they're actually building is mostly a reflection of the people that they hire and once that sinks in this importance of hiring the right people um, also in, in, in managerial positions becomes a lot more clear. It's not the thing in the PowerPoint. It, that might be your plan and that's fine, but the thing that's actually going to happen is going to depend extremely strongly on who you hire. Mm -hmm. Are there certain places where uh, experience is the only way? Like certain specialties For or sure. certain functions? For sure. If you're, uh, I mean, I, I give an extreme example. If you're uh, if you're ab about to go public, having a public market CFO that has been that Walk before yeah. is a very, very useful thing to, 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 mm -hmm. to, to have. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a learning on the job sort of thing at that point. Um, there, there, there are certainly others, but like that, that's like a glaring example, I think. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about what's coming in the future. So uh, we're in kind of a crazy renaissance period, at least in the little aerospace you know, corner of the world that, that we live in every day, um, where so many new technologies are coming online, um, whether they're, and they're primarily being uh, driven out of the commercial world, less so than the government world traditionally. Um, this is probably like the best decade you could possibly imagine to work in, in, in this world. Um, what kinds of things are, are, are really exciting you guys about uh, what's what's coming in the future over the next 30 years? Um, not, not necessarily in aerospace, but may, maybe like within deep tech or, or frontier tech that, uh, that are very exciting. So for me, um, I'll, I'll pick a non-flying thing uh, <laughs> uh, this time. So we're, we're in... Um, a venture investor in an entity called OpenAI, which you might know. And maybe somebody here has played around with DALI, for example, which is an image generation framework. Oh, that Twitter uh, is or, great. Yeah, or GPT-3 <laughs> uh, for language analysis. And um, so I do, do do spend a decent amount of time with the OpenAI folks. And, um, and it's truly astonishing what's uh, coming from large language models or uh, diffusion models these days. And it's not specific only to OpenAI, though that's a very good exemplar, but also at Google or Facebook has a few and the, and the like. I think we barely understand what this would do. So if you go back five years and you talked about self-driving cars, which I know a little bit about, people would basically say, oh, no, 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 self-driving cars might take, you know, might take over within a couple of years all the... the um, uh, all, all, all the jobs, let's say, in trucking or something like that. But the thing that is really, really safe from AI is creative work. That is the last bastion for, for <laughs> humans to fall. Yeah. Fast forward five years, what has actually happened? No, trucks mostly are driven by humans still. But it turns out some of the DALI pictures really put designers to shame. Oh yeah. <laughs> and you can have an almost infinite amount of variants and so on. So we're really terrible at predicting what uh, <laughs> what the use cases of AI are. And Maybe AI will beat us at that, at predicting. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. So, so this is a, a wild card area, I think, that is deeply, deeply interesting for me on, on a personal level since I, uh, I built autonomous systems before and I, this is kind of a large circle of my friends. I kind of in ML AI land. Um, but I also, the reason why I put it forth as an example is also an area where I think we have a history of really screwing up predictions of what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, so I'll, number one, I'm going to preamble by saying we have awesome jobs because what we get to do is sit around and look at all this cool new stuff that's coming and try to wrap your head around it and understand it. And having been you know, working in the startup ecosystem for 30 years now, um, what I can say is there's always going to be more cool new stuff. Like I'm so optimistic about, I don't know what it's going to be necessarily, but I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, but there's always waves of interesting new technology and innovation that are coming. And, you know, in our shop, we're a pretty broad firm. We invest in a lot of different stuff. But an example that I'll give that's not even necessarily tech in the way that often people think of it um, is mRNA vaccines. So think about the COVID uh, environment that we've been in for the last few years and a huge amount of that risk being mitigated by the, the rapid development of these types of vaccines. And a couple of my partners on our life sciences team are deep in that world and working with a number of companies, not COVID specific, but 
MR, mRNA based vaccines for other types of disease. And mm-hmm. it's just a fascinating world. I, I understand about 2% of it and I still mm-hmm. think it's fascinating, but maybe a little more materially in terms of what I'm personally interested in is, is I do a lot of things I mentioned in the, the real estate technology world and the intersection of real estate and climate right now is a fascinating space. So looking at, for example, reducing the carbon footprint of real estate construction is a very big deal. It accounts for a major portion of carbon emissions in the world. And if you can find ways to build that are carbon free or carbon neutral or even carbon reduced, it, it makes a really meaningful dent in carbon emissions around the world. So spending a bunch of time looking at things like that and getting paid to do it is a is a pretty phenomenal job. I feel very lucky. That's cool. for sure true. Yeah. I, I, I think one aspect for for companies that built in the physical world is more and more you get to to stand on the shoulders of giants. So for example, in additive manufacturing now, I, I think it's basically almost every space company basically 3D prints a large chunk of the engines. Um, that is now commonplace. And now all of a sudden you can build engines that are way closer to the CFD, for example, mm-hmm. uh, at much higher performance. You can iterate way, way faster. And you guys certainly are, are, are doing this here, here, here as well. Um, so a lot of these hardware companies do get to stand on the on the shoulders of giant because manufacturing technology has changed, iteration speed is much uh, much higher, the numerical tools are now much much better. I'm old enough to know that you know that there used to be a CAD tool and then like you maybe had like a, a a separate tool for like a static analysis. Now you can you can get like Fusion 360 for example and costs almost nothing and you can you you can do like a decent chunk of the analysis like everything has gotten so much better that now small companies all of a sudden can think about doing work that was really the the domain of governments or like large standing defense contractors or something like that before that startups just couldn't attempt but we do get to stand on the shoulders of giants now mm-hmm. yeah all the compute resources that are coming online and even just for you know there are free gpus and uh, compute resources you can stand up just as a person, and that's just a wild new absolutely. phase. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, that's great. Yeah, so you you mentioned defense. Um, there's been obviously a lot of talk, uh, given you know what's going on in, in Europe for for the past six months, um, about what the future of national security looks like. Um, how do you guys see that fitting in to the picture, especially from an investing perspective? Um, you know, it's. Obviously, Silicon Valley's roots are, are pretty closely tied to uh, to the Defense Department, um, but some would argue that they've kind of grown apart over the past couple of decades. And, For sure. Um, to some, I think it seems like now that's maybe changing. Um, you know, given all all sorts of different things. But um, you know, obviously, part of what we do here at Hermius is is support uh, you know, national security with the the platforms that we're building. Um, so yeah, curious how how you guys think about that from from an investing perspective as it plays into the next couple of decades. You know, for us, I wouldn't say we don't have like a specific defense investing strategy, to be clear. Um, it's more derivative of the companies that we're in. That, mm-hmm. And I think every company we've done that has defense applications, like I've got a um, high resolution weather modeling company called Tomorrow IO that I'm invested in and on the board of. And the U.S. Air Force is a big customer of theirs, but so are commercial airlines and all kinds of other vertical markets and enterprises around the world. So it's usually a dual track strategy for us. And, you know, I do think that things in the government world you know, in particular, where it's very, very different is a lot of the go to market, Mm -hmm. what you call the go to market motion in a startup land. It's the process by which you contract and sell your products is entirely different Mm -hmm. when you're selling into the government markets. Acquisition means a very different thing in the defense world than the investing world. I I made the mistake of sending Vinod an email once that said that and he's like, what are you are you sure you want to be thinking about an acquisition <laughs> in this space? It's like different, different acquisition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Namespace collision. Um, so it's just a different mindset, I think. But and and so for us, like it, we are usually looking at technologies that do have those dual dual track applications. As do you guys. I mean, the ultimate mm-hmm. ambition is to build a passenger aircraft as well, and and that's something that uh, is very much on our minds when we look at these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one hundred percent true for 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 us. So. Yeah, at Rocket Lab, we'll fly NRO missions because they're they're a good partner, and we'll fly commercial missions. Um, but the 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 end goal is to build a commercial entity that can also have the government as a customer. Um, so we are, we also don't have a dedicated fund, for example, only for defense applications or anything like that. 
the the things we invest in um, often turn out to be good partners to to the U.S. government for various agencies, and that's good. Um, but it is typically a commercial a commercial plan behind it, and and that's what we're really investing behind. And you can also see, I mean, the, your your parallel to to DARPA stuff, AJ, I think is interesting. I mean, for all of us that have done things related to the internet for the last several decades, you can't ignore the role of DARPA in creating mm-hmm. the internet to begin with, and so. We, we do look for, and again, I think Hermius is a great example of this, a, a firm where the work you're doing with the government helps create the platform that then has commercial application down the road as well. And that synergistic relationship, to your point, AJ, has been part of Silicon Valley since the beginning and still is now. Yeah, so you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but what, what makes it hard uh, to invest in things that are either maybe temporally more focused on defense, where uh, a defense market is that bridge to a, a, a longer, uh, longer-term longer commercial market, or perhaps kind of, you know, pure defense. What makes, uh, you know, in equity investing in, in those types of areas difficult? I think there have been two things. One is um, maybe culturally, in, in particular in Silicon Valley, it became less and less of a thing to invest in, in, in defense technology, mostly due to the fact that other sectors like in particular consumer internet, for example, were just really a lot more attractive sectors to, 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 to put money in. Um, and then there's basically not that much knowledge in Silicon Valley on how the U.S. government will behave as a customer. And that makes it just hard to invest in some of the, the things that principally have the U.S. government as a, as a customer. Um, and that has... You know, it's a function of just not exercising this muscle for, for, for a long time. And I think also the U.S. government in various agencies wasn't really good interacting with startups either. And I do see this going a little bit back and where, where people now have a little bit of mutual respect of like what each counterparty needs and a little bit more understanding of, uh, of, um, of what, for example, do investors need? What does a startup need? How do I interact with a startup if I'm a government agency and so on? And, and there's been some genuinely good innovation. So I think we are now getting back into a scenario where the U.S. government can be more and more in a, um, a decent partner also for startups, like very much like it, like it is for you. So I do see it changing now. Um, maybe not quite at the speed that I would like, but um, <laughs> it, is, it is changing now. It is. It does take a long time to turn an aircraft carrier <laughs> for sure for sure <laughs> yeah. on both sides i would say yes so to kind of bring this home uh what what are you guys looking forward to uh in the more, maybe more near-term future with what we're building here here at hermius yeah. oh yeah well first flight <laughs> comes to mind <laughs> yeah um <laughs> a trip to the desert to watch one take off will be fun oh yeah yep absolutely absolutely that that's of course the big sort of defining moment sort of thing um uh, there is a there's a bunch of test data I look very much forward to. This is maybe a little bit more on the you know slightly geeky side. <laughs> um, uh, so so that's exciting. Um, I Sven, do you have Winplot? I, I do actually. Oh <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I asked that. <laughs> it's, it's a good guess. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, uh, so so those are big big items. I'm excited about. Um, about the manufacturing part of it mm-hmm. and how we uh, uh, how how we'll accomplish this. So there, there's a bunch of like technical developments I, I get very excited about. There's also a couple of business developments I'm I'm genuinely Pleasure. Um, curious about and uh, how they're going to progress because they they they're very promising now and so so I'm, That'd I'm, be I'm fun. curious how those are going to progress. But um, the technical ones kind of stand out. Oh yeah, cool. Well, thank you guys so much again for making the trip all the way out here to Atlanta to be here in person and of not course. on Zoom to, to do this. Um, and uh, yeah, we look forward to checking in again. Maybe we'll do a, a little episode out in the desert. Oh, well, we go yeah, that'd be fun. super fun. Yeah, oh, let's yeah. do that. Great. <laughs>